tonight. Terror trials in the age of Trump. The GOP makes its move on taxes. And Mississippi's failing schools. It hurts. It really hurts. Because I thought we had made it past that point. The Great Pyramid of Giza has been around for more than 4,500 years. But today, scientists announced they've discovered a hidden pocket inside the pyramid. The international team from the Scan Pyramids Project used an X-ray-like process to identify areas that are empty or solid. They don't think anyone's been inside the 100-foot-long chamber since the pyramid was built. And no one knows what, if anything, the chamber contains. The State Department announced this week it will be issuing new passports to convicted sex offenders so that the travel documents will indicate the conviction. It's to comply with the International Megan's Law, which was passed last year to stop child exploitation and child sex tourism. The language identifying sex offenders would be printed inside the passport's back cover. Sam Clovis, President Trump's pick to be the U.S. Department of Agriculture's chief scientist, has withdrawn his nomination. Reports surfaced that he was interviewed last week by special counsel Robert Mueller's team and testified before a grand jury investigating Russia's activities to influence the 2016 election. Clovis served as Trump's national campaign co-chair and supervised aide-turned-informant George Papadopoulos. For now, Clovis will continue to serve as the USDA's senior White House advisor. In remarks today, Energy Secretary Rick Perry argued that fossil fuels can help prevent sexual assault. Perry was reflecting on his recent trip to Africa and explained how getting oil or coal-powered electricity into villages there would improve safety. But also from the standpoint of sexual assault, when the lights are on, when you have light, it shines the, uh, the righteousness, if you will, of, of on, on those types of acts. Texas Republican Lamar Smith is the latest member of Congress to announce he's not running for re-election in 2018. Smith is one of 12 Republicans to announce their retirement so far this year. At least five other Republicans are getting out of the congressional game to run for governor of their respective states. Smith is a climate change skeptic who currently chairs the House Science Committee and has served in the House since 1987. House Republicans unveiled their long-awaited tax bill today. The bill has been Speaker Paul Ryan's singular obsession for years, and he wasted no time in starting up the sales job. The Tax Cut and Jobs Act will deliver real relief for people in the middle, people who are also striving to get there. The plan would enact huge changes, touching nearly every segment of the American public and business community. But first, it would have to pass. It sounds weird to say this about political talking points, but Paul Ryan's comment isn't entirely spin. If this bill passed, a lot of Americans' taxes would go down. The bill does that by collapsing the current seven tax brackets to four. It also nearly doubles something called the standard deduction, the amount everyone can exempt from their taxable income. That would become $12,000 for single people and $24,000 for married couples. Big corporations would be even bigger winners in this bill. It cuts the corporate tax rate from 35 to 20 percent. And so-called pass-through companies, which include not just small businesses, but also family partnerships like the one Donald Trump used to run, will get their tax rate cut too. Right now, America's dead last in the industrialized world because we have the highest tax rate. And just like these families behind me, they want to see more money in their pockets. They deserve to have more shots at the American dream. This is all well and good for you, me, and the corporations, but the money you'd be getting has to come from somewhere. We don't know yet how much the bill is going to cost. What we do know is the GOP's decided to accept a $1.5 trillion hike in the deficit as a result of this tax reform bill. And that's where this bill could make things worse. To make the math work, it would get rid of a lot of things that benefit average people like deductions for student loan interest payments and medical expenses. 
But it also messes with a lot of provisions that powerful lobbying groups and trade organizations love. Universities are pissed they're losing a deduction when it comes to their endowments. Realtors and builders unions are angry about the move to slash the mortgage interest deduction in half. Interest groups like these are going to descend on Capitol Hill tomorrow, if they haven't already, lobbying hard to change the bill, or even kill it. So what you see today is probably not what you're going to get. President Trump is now calling for the execution of Seyfulo Saipov, the immigrant from Uzbekistan who killed eight people on Tuesday in the worst terror attack in New York City since 9-11. Just the day before, he said he'd consider sending Saipov to Guantanamo Bay. Send him to Gitmo. I would certainly consider that, yes. And called the civilian court system a joke. Today, the White House tried to downplay Trump's comments, and for good reason. Saipov has already been charged in civilian court on at least one count that carries the death penalty. But Trump's outbursts could make it harder to prosecute him. Mary B. McCord, a former federal prosecutor who oversaw a successful terror indictment in New York last year, explains why. Prosecuting a terrorist is not really different than prosecuting other any other defendant who's been accused of a crime. Um, all the standards are exactly the same. Uh, the government must prove by probable cause in front of a grand jury that a crime has been committed. And to convict after trial, it must prove beyond a reasonable doubt every element of the crimes charged. I was heartened to see that President Trump pulled back from the notion that Guantanamo Bay would be an appropriate place for the New York terror suspect. What we've seen historically is that the federal court system, using the authority to prosecute under Article 3 of the Constitution, has been by far the most effective at successfully and efficiently prosecuting international terrorists. We have an incredibly successful track record getting substantial sentences for international terrorists. I think it is important for the public to see these people brought to trial, brought to justice fairly under our system of law, right in the area, you know, right in the community where the attack took place. It's not helpful and it does make the job of prosecutors more difficult when there are statements, either off the cuff statements or tweets being made by um, people, government officials in high levels. And, and the reason it makes things more difficult is not because the prosecutors can't just block that out and do their business. It's because there are, that lends itself to arguments that a defendant can make in court that these tweets or these off-the-cuff comments go broadly across uh, the country, and so there's no place they can get a fair trial. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was in London today to meet with British Prime Minister Theresa May and to mark the 100th anniversary of a document that looms large in the history of both countries and in the history of modern conflict, the Balfour Declaration. On November 2, 1917, the British Foreign Secretary, Arthur James Balfour, sent a short letter to Britain's most influential Jewish figure, Lord Walter Rothschild. Those 67 words became known as the Balfour Declaration. It set out a simple promise that Britain would use its, quote, best endeavors for the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. It's a founding document celebrated in Israel. For Palestinians, it's the original sin. Palestinians and Israelis are in a state of permanent conflict. They have been for a long time. And I think they agree that the Balfour Declaration is the moment when that conflict begins to take shape in its modern form. At the time, Britain's global dominance was under grave threat, imperiled by stalemate in the First World War. The Allies aren't doing so well. They're bogged down on the Western Front. Hundreds of thousands of British and Allied troops have been killed. But the Allies, the British and the French in particular, are looking forward to the defeat of the Ottomans. And they're thinking about how to carve up that territory. In this context, Britain's new Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, a staunch Christian, decided to back the cause of the small and struggling Zionist movement. 
After centuries of persecution, the Jewish diaspora had a compelling moral case for a homeland. But there were political calculations as well. It was often presented as being altruistic, that the a magnanimous gesture by the British towards the suffering Jews. But the truth is, it was a mixture of hard-headed, selfish British motives to serve its interests. Palestine was vital to the British as a link between Egypt, the Suez Canal, and the British-run subcontinent of South Asia. A loyal Zionist-run state under British protection would have strategic value and keep the territory out of French control. But the Balfour Declaration was also divisive among Jews. There was significant opposition from Jews in Britain to the idea of a declaration in favor of the Zionist movement. They were enjoying freedoms which had n not come easily to them. They were a minority, they had suffered from anti-Semitism, uh, and they really feared this idea of Jewish nationalism, which would undermine uh, the sense that they belonged in the countries where they were living. The letter itself contained an important reservation. The civil and religious rights of Palestine's existing non-Jewish communities should not be infringed. In 1922, the post-war League of Nations established the British mandate with the understanding that the land would be shared by Jews and Arabs. But in the years that followed, Jewish immigration to Palestine grew quickly. And it met with immediate protests from the majority of the population who were Arabs. They objected to this influx of people they saw as foreign settlers. Jews saw themselves as immigrants returning. And over time, the increasing numbers of Jewish immigrants made the conflict that was looming with the native Arab majority more and more bitter. What followed were waves of dispossession, migration, and violence that began to tear Palestine apart. Hundreds of thousands of Palestinians lost their homeland. Millions of Jews gained a new one. And in May of 1948, the Balfour Declaration became a reality with the formation of the modern state of Israel. Mississippi has one of the most segregated school systems in America, and one of the most unequal. Reformers have fought for decades to change that. Let the Mississippi people know this is now the law of the land. Without much success. The results of federal attempts to integrate here are an all-black public school system. So the Southern Poverty Law Center is trying something unusual, filing a federal lawsuit that argues that the state is violating a law passed in the aftermath of the Civil War. Antonia Hilton has more. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Sing a file. Good morning. A flag of Cadence Burton goes to Heidelberg Elementary in Clarksdale, Mississippi. She's most educators' dream. She's a high-performing first grader who does fourth grade math. Hi. I like reading because it helps me learn new vocabulary words, and I like I like math because you you can learn new problems. All right, Kaden. Bob and dears. But she's stuck in an F-graded district. Clarksdale sits in the heart of the Mississippi Delta, one of the poorest regions in the state. Delta schools are some of the worst, not just in Mississippi, but in the country. Only 14% of kids in the district are proficient in reading. Here at Heidelberg, just 5% of students are proficient in math. You know, having a certified math teacher in the classroom, uh, English teacher. You Superintendent Dennis Debris can't afford to fill many vacancies, and it's hard for him to recruit qualified teachers. Yeah, this is the science lab. And we used to have kids just come in here and do experiments, and now, you know, it just sits without a, without a teacher in here. When it rains, the 50-year-old buildings flood. Students use outdated textbooks. Some teachers buy their own teaching supplies. Like most states, Mississippi uses a complex formula for how it funds its schools. 
but for almost two decades, the state hasn't fully funded them. That hurts more in poor districts than in wealthy white ones, where taxpayers can make the difference up on their own. In Clarksdale, they're short $12 million. We should be able to have the same opportunities of those districts that are really rich. Our kids deserve as much as anybody else's. The Southern Poverty Law Center says that discrepancy is against the law. This isn't the way it has to be. It certainly isn't the way it was supposed to be. Will Bardwell is the lead attorney on a new, some would say bizarre, lawsuit with a historical twist using a 147-year-old law that's still relevant today. After the Civil War, Congress made Mississippi agree to the Readmission Act in order to rejoin the Union. That law mandated that the state constitution provide all its citizens with a uniform system of public schools, that they could never change that. But since 1890 and up to the present day, Mississippi has gradually whittled well past the point where it's not uniform. In 1890, lawmakers hacked down the education clause. Over the next few decades, they made it crystal clear they wanted segregated schools. The Mississippi legislature has always preferred predominantly white schools over predominantly black schools. Why don't they want you to go to school with them? Because we black and they white. That's right. In the 1960s, after the landmark Brown versus Board decision, Mississippi lawmakers resisted and again chipped away at its educational promise. I think our ultimate aim is to undo the integration by the numbers game. By the time you get to the most recent iteration, which was passed in 1987, uh, it allows the legislature to make that system of public schools look like whatever they want it to look like. Today, Mississippi schools are as segregated as they were in the 1950s. All of the 19 F-graded schools in the state are poor and over 80% black. 13 of the 14 A-graded public schools are majority white. Do you think that Mississippi has broken their promise? When they made it, it was broken. It was just fake. The right angle. Pinky Johnson oh, grew up in Clarksdale straight. and has taught in the schools for 40 years. Makes an A. The schools were so racist when she came up. She graduated at 16 right. because she had to get out. What do you think it would take to give the children here in Clarksdale a fair chance? Politicians that will not will be against discrimination. I'm two cheerleaders. Let's go. We need resources. Hey, when the resources come in, we need you to be fair with them. Hey, hey, black hey. Mississippi officials declined an interview with Vice News. In a statement after the suit was filed, Lieutenant Governor Reeves called the SPLC misguided and cynical and accused them of fundraising on the backs of taxpayers. The thing is, the SPLC isn't asking for money or damages, just acknowledgement that the state violated the law, that it has a legal obligation to do better by its kids. It offers no suggestions on how to do that or how to pay for it. What do you expect or hope to happen if you win? I have to assume that Governor Bryant and all the other defendants in this lawsuit are going to recognize that they have a higher legal obligation than they thought they had and get to work on that problem. If they don't, we'll have to cross that bridge when we get to it. So for students like Cadence, it's unlikely they'll see any change. Do you ever worry that the lack of resources in the school system will hold your daughter back? I do. It hurts. It really hurts because I thought we had made it past that point, you know? I thought maybe everyone could come to an agreement that this is for the kids and we're gonna do this for the kids. Man, man, I did good today. You did good today? Okay. Okay. You do good every day. In the tree-lined suburbs just outside of Detroit, the Coleman's, Ashley Antoinette and Jaquavis, a married couple who are high school sweethearts, write New York Times bestsellers together. We don't like to let 
great ideas escape us. So we got this thing where we just, every idea, every log line, every synopsis, every title, we put on sticky notes. Between them, they've written 44 books in 11 years. When you walk into a room, when you're a New York Times bestseller, you walk in with power. You know, so it's like walking in with 10 goons behind you, right? Because <laughs> you, you have that, that stamp of approval that X amount of people love your work. Yeah. So you have an audience. What was your first book deal like? Uneventful, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> in the beginning, you're writing strictly off passion. You know, nobody's paying you big bucks to write your first book. Flynn is the mother of our creativity. Yeah, it's the source. It's where we pull everything from. Ashley and Jaquavis live an hour from where they grew up, and they make a point to visit as much as they can. Like, every day, that's how the trash looking every day. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, because you got to live out of water bottles, see? Yeah. That's crazy. The couple met in a cinematic manner befitting their books. Likewise, how you doing? Quavo was running from an undercover cop with nine ounces of cocaine. Yeah, right there. Okay, right there. That bush right there. As he was tackled onto the ground, he tossed the package into Ashley's yard. She hid it, told no one, and returned it to him later that night. The story became their first book, Dirty Money. Their subsequent novels, thrillers and sprawling crime sagas, aren't unlike your usual best-selling fare, yet they're designated as urban or street lit. What do you think about the moniker, like, street lit? It is what it is. I know street literature, it gets a black eye, right? Because we're writing about these seedy underworlds in the black market, but really the only thing we're doing is holding up a mirror. So it kind of hurts when you see the truth. So they frown on it because they don't understand. And it's, sometimes it's kind of hard to digest. This was the thing about reading books. There were no characters that looked like us. Yeah. Like, we came up on, he loves John Grisham, yeah. and I was reading, like, as a very young girl, like the Sweet Valley High books. And right. I was escaping this world, this violent, gritty city that I was in. I was reading about the white picket fences, but those girls didn't look like me. They didn't talk like me. They didn't they have like a mama like mine, you know, yeah, none of that. Aryan. <laughs> exactly, I couldn't relate to any of that. So when we decided to write, we wanted to write what was real to us. We wanted to write about faces like ours, about circumstances like ours. At what point do stories created by African Americans about African Americans get to just be stories? The most profitable movie of the year is Get Out by Jordan Peele. Shonda Rhimes and Lee Daniels are kingmakers. With a devout fan base and prominent placement at major booksellers, it's no wonder that the Colemans are being tapped for TV. Not prestige or niche TV, but mainstream network shows. We signed a deal with uh, NBC mm -hmm. Universal, and we signed a deal with Warner Brothers. So we'll be creating for television. What kind of stories can we expect from you guys for TV? We're writing family shows. We're writing um, YA shows. We're writing, of course, a street show, yeah. which science is phenomenal. Fiction. Yeah, we're writing science fiction. Yeah. So we're not limiting ourselves at all. That's the beauty about Hollywood. It takes us off a leash. That's Vice News Tonight for Thursday, November 2nd. 